for 30 seconds or three minutes, whatever it is, I'm going to, I'm just going to believe they're right. I'm just going to push the, I believe button. And when you do that, what happens is you ask questions to learn more about where they're at and why they think that. And I, and I think leaders aren't, are not only are they not born, we're we're born anti-leaders because you're born wired to want to be in control. So you have to fight that. So you have to act contrary because your instincts will be, you can't go crazy and just say, do whatever everyone do. Like that's irresponsible. But when you're feeling that and you're feeling that sort of tinge of anxiety, then you're on the right track. If you're not feeling it, then you're too comfortable and you're not building a team. How do you build a team of people who can think for themselves. This is Love Your Work, and I'm David Cadavy. I'm here to help you cut out the noise to focus. L. David Marquet had spent a year preparing to captain a submarine in the U.S. Navy, but at the last minute, he was assigned to a different submarine. Not only was it a different ship than the one he had prepared for, it was also the worst ship in its fleet. It was so bad, only three men had re-enlisted. Since David didn't know the ship, and since the situation was so bad, he had to try something different. Instead of using the leader-follower model, he started using a new leader-leader model. Instead of David giving orders, and instead of his men asking permission, he started empowering each sailor to think for himself. You may have heard Jason Fried on episode one recommend David's book, Turn the Ship Around. In it, David Marquet tells the story of how his leader-leader model turned the USS Santa Fe from worst to first. The year after David took command of the ship, 36 men re-enlisted instead of just three. In the decade following, 10 of those men would go on to become submarine captains themselves. David was in Medellin, and I sat down with him to talk about this and more. How does the leader-leader model save mental energy for everyone involved? How can you encourage your micromanaging boss, if you have one, to use a leader leader. And how did David go from being a submarine captain to writing a book that USA Today calls one of the top 12 business books of all time? How did he learn to tell stories? How did he actually get the writing done? And since this was a live interview, I was able to stream it on Periscope. And as Periscope goes, that video has now disappeared. But I was able to grab it and splice it together with the audio to make a nice, video version of the episode is available to some levels of Love Your Work Elite members on their exclusive personal RSS feeds. To join Love Your Work Elite and get access to master classes, office hours with me, and early access to episodes, visit lywelite.com. That's lywelite.com. Here's David Marquet. Okay, so... L. David Marquet. Yeah. What are you doing in Medellin? <laughs> why are you in Colombia? Why, why am I in Medellin? Because uh, I knew a guy who knew a guy. <laughs> and um, there's cool stuff going on down here. And they invited me down, and I'm spending a whole week. Brought my wife. I'm doing a keynote, then a whole day workshop, and then they... Um, a luncheon, and there's a uh, there's a group in the city that is trying to create an entrepreneurial tech hub, and I'm helping. I want to help them because I think it's important. There's something you hear about you hear a lot here. Medellin is constantly kind of branding itself as like, oh, it's like the Silicon going to be a Silicon Valley of yeah. Latin America. I probably have. I don't. I don't think anybody should try to be the Silicon Valley of anything. But they should be what they what whatever they are. Right. But yeah, they're definitely putting a lot of effort forth. There's that think tank that you're working with and stuff. Yeah. So I'm working. So my, my sponsor to bring me down here is a is a is a think tank, which is uh, Matt. It's called Massive Action and Think Tank. M A N T. But they refer to it as Might, because apparently M A N T in Spanish when you look at it. Sounds like might, but M A ampersand T, and it was co-founded by a guy who who runs a very successful construction company, and he's dedicated to creating people who can make decisions, who are engaging their brains, 
who are breaking from the mold of the classical hierarchical, you know, do what you're told, the jefe and everybody else. And they're really doing good things. And uh, it's my, it's called Might, M-A-N-T. You guys can check them out. And I, it's, it's pretty impressive. So, uh, that, that's, uh, so you're doing consulting, like leadership consulting with them. You're, you're teaching them how to do, and we're going to get into like your leader, leader yeah. model yeah. Of, of leadership. Yeah. And yeah. It's, that's interesting because Colombia, as we were talking about earlier, is such like a hierarchical culture. It's so right. much... Right. Like, oh, what, what the boss says right. type of thing. Everybody, it's usted all the time. <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah, and, but, you know, it's not just Colombia. I go all over the world. And, because work used to be about our hands. We, we, come with like, we come to work to do our jobs. Why do? Do is an action verb. It's a, like, we don't say I come to work and think my job. Even though most of us actually think our jobs when we're at work. Yeah. But it sounds weird because the language is captured by the past industrial age experience. So what I think is, I think we, we by default, use this language, which is anchoring us in the ways of the past, even without, even without really meaning to. And I'll give you another example. Was out in California, t- a tech company, tech company was having a meeting with the entire company software company, 1,500 people. The guys are doing great, growing, whatever. You know what they call that meeting? An all-hands meeting. All hands, because... Because the hands are doing because, things. Yeah, because that's what it was. Like, all hands was an old sailing ship thing from oh, right, hundreds yeah. of years ago, because that's what we wanted people for. We hired you for your hands. Another hand on deck, or yeah, you're, you're one-handing exactly, a sailboat. Exactly. I know that from, from learning some exactly, sailing. But, it's about, but, but a tech company, no one's doing anything with their hands. They're not hired for their hands. I mean, they may do some they're, typing. They're typing. They're typing. But, mice and, but it's because of this. But it's because of the brain. But yeah. we don't call it an all-heads company, or an all-brains, or an all-hearts company. We call it an all-hands yeah. company, because the language... Because we're just using the language that we know, which is the language of the Industrial Revolution. And so, and so, but I think that, that it also creates basically an anchor. It subtly kind of keeps us back in that thing. And we need to kind of deliberately break from those patterns and go to new language patterns designed for the kind of work that we want to do today. And it's a different language. So the way we approach leadership training It's not like history class. I see a lot of people approach it like history. I'm going to teach you something and you'll know it. I don't think that's the right approach. The right approach is it's a language. I'm going to give you a few words and you're going to practice them. And then when you get comfortable with those, I'm going to give you a few more words. You're going to practice those. Just like here, we're in Medellin. We've got to practice a little bit of Spanish. My Spanish is terrible. (laughs) But it's about practicing the language. And so, so we're teaching a new language of leadership. Yeah, the new language of interacting. Language is such a big part of the things that you're teaching in this book. Yeah. Turn the ship around. Yeah. Basically, you were a Navy captain of the worst submarine in, <laughs> in the fleet, and you turned it around through this leader-leader model yeah. that, um, that is what you're teaching people now. Yeah, exactly. So I was super lucky because the plan for me was to go, was for a year had been to go be the captain of a different submarine and I was all trained I had studied the ship studied all of the like every, the, the piping diagrams every, the wiring everything diagrams, all down everything I knew I call it and then your supervisor calls you and says yeah. uh yeah you're not going to go on that exactly. ship you're going to go on a different ship which was a different kind of submarine and different kind of submarine the Santa Fe was one of the newest submarines in the fleet and so not only was there was this problem the reason I went Los there was... Los Angeles-class submarine. Yeah, uh, improved Los Angeles-class. Oh, improved yeah. Los Angeles-class. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, big difference. My Wikipedia. I need to go update, update that. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, so what happened was... So I call it know-all, tell-all leadership. The leadership that I was trained in was the best you could be as a leader was to give really good and precise orders and have people follow them. That was like the five minute mile of leadership. 
But I thought it was. So a, how does anybody do that on a giant submarine? You've got to run all over that, these, these that, tight hallways. That's every the time. whole you thing. Do that? Well, because a lot of times it's through phones and what kind of thing. But that's why I had uh, to. That, yes, I had to go through this whole twelve months of schooling to learn the ship. So I go twelve months of schooling to learn Olympia, even though I'd been a submarine officer for fifteen years, right? And this, and so what happens is I go to the Santa Fe. It's the worst ship in the fleet. Morale is terrible. We re-enlisted three guys in the last 12 months, which is like the lowest the Navy ever saw. And the, and the guy who was there was quit. He resigned. He said, no mas. And uh, that's very unusual for a submarine. The previous captain. Yeah, the previous captain. He was supposed to be there for another year. And so they, they, I got airdropped in. I When you were, you were air, like, the, the captain quit? While the, the ship was in the middle of the well, the no, not, not in the litter, litter. They were they were at port, but I got. Yeah, I, I guess it's possible. Like, I'm just picturing out, you going a helicopter. I could have gotten air dropped in, but I didn't. I got I, but they, I had two weeks. I go over there, and um, it's weird because you know, like the physics are the same, but the specific buttons you push and everything are different. And I gave an order which couldn't be done, and the officer actually ordered it, and he said, "I," and then when it came to the light, that you couldn't be done. So he said, well, like you told me to do it. And so... As I, I understand it, basically the, this, this ship had four gears. Yeah. And you're asking then the him to put into it in the gear. fifth gear. Basically, that was it. it was that's all. Wait, what was the reaction like in that moment? Uh, well, I was... Uh, uh, my reaction or the crew? Well, the, yeah, the crew's reaction. No, they expected Remember. me to yell and scream and, like, blame people. And I was... And I had a momentary impulse... To say, look, you guys, you guys, right? That's always a good start. Like, mm-hmm. you guys need to speak up. You need to be proactive. You need to take initiative. If I say something and it's wrong, you got, you need to, you know, push back on me. But the problem is, I and I, I think of it as like I was leaning into the crew. All leaders lean into the team below them. We task and get reporting, and then we leaning down. And they lean into their people all the way down. That's how they make things happen. And, and finally, uh, this young man says to me, I think actually I, we need you to change because at this point it was, the problem was out there and it was not about me. And I realized, you know, I think you're right because I can only change, I'm only in control of my own behavior. Like in trying to control other people is just manipulation. And so I actually lean back. I said, my job is gonna be lean back. I'm never gonna tell you another order. And I'm gonna lean back and that's going to create the space for you to lean into me. And it's going to be based on language. So I, so I said, I never used the word be, em- thou shalt be empowered. I just said, say what you intend to do. Just tell me what you intend to do. And if I don't stop you, you're doing it. So they're going to do the thinking about, like, what's, what's a particular task that they might come to you with? Right. So let's say loading a torpedo. In the past, I would say, I want you to load this torpedo in that tube at 10 o'clock tomorrow or whatever it was. Now, once they started down the task, they were fine because they could do that. But they weren't, they weren't at a level where they would come to me and say, oh, you know what? I think we really need to load the story. I think we need to start the reactor. I think we need to submerge the ship. Those decisions. And so I started thinking about work in terms of two different kinds of work, uh, which I now call red work and blue work, just kind of arbitrarily pick, picked it. But the red work is the production work. The red work is in agile. The red work is the sprint. And then the blue work is the thinking work, is the decision work. It's not st- strictly because you could argue there's thinking here, but it's production, decision. Are we ready? What did we learn? Are we re- let's decide what we're going to do next. Then let's produce. And when you're producing, you can't, you don't want to interfere with the team that much. You want to just let them produce. And they're picking how long those production cycles are, I think is really interesting. And I think... Um, I think that at the beginning of a project, those cycles ought to be pretty short. Like maybe they're only a week long. Toward the end of a project, maybe they get longer and longer because because there's this natural cycle in a project where there are there are a lot of unresolved issues at the beginning. We gotta, we got to spend time getting clear on those, and we and but then towards the end, we just got to get the thing out. <laughs> so let's just get the work done, right? But I don't know exactly what that phasing is, but I started thinking in terms of decide, do. 
decide, do. And I needed my team to make those. I needed, and, and the old school was I decide, they do. I decide, they do. What I needed was them to decide, them to do. Them to decide, them to do. It sounds like, I, mean, I talk a lot about mental energy on this, this podcast, uh, um, about the management of mental energy being so important to being productive. And it seems like as a leader, if you have to do all, make all of the decisions, then you're just going to be out of mental energy. It's totally exhausting. It's, you, you have just exhaustion. And it, it, I will tell you, as I came up through the ranks, and I thought about leadership, I felt like I was the locomotive on the front end of a train. Like I was the guy pulling the organization along. I was the guy making the decisions, quote, inspiring people and all that other crap. And now when we flipped it, I now felt like a caboose and with a hundred locomotives behind me, or in my case, 135 locomotives behind me, and they were just all pushing on me. And I was just like, whoa, guys, you're going too fast. Like it was almost like that. But what happened, so it's exactly about mental energy. So what happens is on a sub, the, the job of a submarine commander, when you really kind of boil it down, is just to find patterns. So it's a very opaque, uncertain world out there. And you're trying to figure out like what is happening? Where's the enemy? Where are they hiding? Where could they be hiding? What's, what's, what is really going on? And, and, and so what happens is if you're down in the weeds, you don't see the patterns. And so I would just be sitting back and the crew would be doing their things. Say, hey, we're doing this. We're doing this. I say, okay, great, great, great. And I would spend very little energy on that. And I just kind of look and say, you know, this thing I'm seeing on sonar and this thing we're seeing on, on, on the, you know, the electronic, the, you know, we would intercept radio signals. And this thing I read about in the Intel, I think maybe those are all connected. What do you guys think? And they'd be like, oh my God, you're a genius. Like, how did you do that? Well, the reason I did it is because my brain was empty and I had space for that. You guys have to do, you guys were doing that and you allowed me, but we could never do that before. And I think... So it freed up the space. I mean, I, I'm yeah. just talking to David Allen. Yeah. There's so many great Davids in this world. Yeah, everybody's, yeah. Uh, it, David's rule of the world. All about getting the things out of your brain so that you have the mental space then to, to have ideas in the moment. Yeah. Because it doesn't take any time to have an idea. Right. It's, but if you have the mental space, and you right. have the mental space because you've off, you've delegated not just the doing, but you've delegated some of the yeah. thinking as well. Yeah then you actually have the mental space to think more creatively. And I had to let go because on every submarine in the fleet, we had a thing which we call a a tickler, which is a to-do list. Everyone would keep to-do lists for the people below them. This big to-do list for all the department heads. It was a huge binder, all these things. And I finally just, I threw it out. I said, look guys, we had a big ceremony. I'm throwing it out. I'm not keeping track of what you have to do. I refuse to do that because I'm just poaching your job ownership. Like if I come down to your office, hey, what's going on with this? That just sucks. So, so, so I said, do you know what your job is? Engineer, do you know? Yes. Do you need me to come down and tell you? No. Do you own it? Yes. I'm going to get out of your way. And so, New rule, you can make your yeah, own to-do list. Right, right. so they would come to me. They would people. say, you can keep, the rule was you can keep a to-do list for your boss, but you couldn't keep a to-do list for the guys below you. Oh, cool. You keep a to-do list for yourself. But it was awesome because I just, I just said, okay, fine. I knew there would be things that would fall through the cracks. But if they were important, they would come back and we would do it. But the value of having a guy own his job versus like if, if your boss is coming out and checking on you, it, you don't own your job. Your boss owns your job. Mm-hmm. Right? And so, and so if you know, no one is going to come down and check on you. No one's going to say, hey, I need a weekly update. You want to update me? Fine. You decide and come and give me an update. You own it. And that, it's that feeling of ownership that really made things amazing on this ship. And we made, you know, the stories in the book, but we set uh, records for retention, performance. And the cool thing was 10 years later, 10 guys became submarine captains because we had made... Which is a very high... It's a huge disproportionate number, yeah. So... That was a cool thing. So can, can we just paint, because I think that a, a, a submarine, a nuclear submarine, is a different environment from what most of our listeners yeah. are working in. So like, can we kind of paint the scene of like what that environment is, what, what are the stakes, what are, 
how do things usually operate? Yeah, it's, you know, it's a different environment, but it would be eerily familiar. Like the problems that we have every day, the... So it's this, this cramped space. Okay, so it's a very cramped space. We have 135 people. The ship's 360 feet long, but the real actual space that you work in is probably only about 150 feet. Okay, so it's a cramped space. There's no windows, so you're trying to figure out what's going on in the outside world. And it's an amazing... You only have instruments in front of we you. We have a lot of instruments. So we're reading instruments. We're interpreting the uncertainty of the outside. We're making predictions about the future. We're trying to connect things. You've got an active enemy who's trying to kill you. And if you make a mistake, they're going to exploit it. And, but, it's, but it's a very amazing machine because if operated properly, you're basically... No one on the planet can find you. I mean, the, 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 the number of technologies and, pe- and organizations that could find you is for all ten zero. And who was the active enemy at that point in time? Well, we... Um, if you at, can share that. <laughs> well, the... Uh, so... <laughs> so we have potential adversaries, right? And we we, we, we want... That most people don't know about. Well, you know, that could be... Yeah, it's like, they're in the news. North Korea, China, Iran. Um, you know, pick your... You might be sharing uh, some water dr- with dr- them. Drug... Um, not, not, yeah, we, we did a little stuff for, with against drug guys for a while, but kind of terrorists um, monitoring where a certain terrorist... A terrorist using a certain cell phone... The cell phone has a signal. It's bouncing off a certain tower. We can it can can we figure that out? Okay, there he must be within a couple miles of that tower. So you might be on a mission to get into a position right. where, if needed, you can launch a torpedo on land or yeah, a missile or a, a SEAL team, you know, or something. I guess torpedoes like don't go on land. Yeah, right? <laughs> we, we, we call it a, a missile. missile. <laughs> but same idea. So, but but basically, it, it's all about problem solving, and we have this physical machine that we need to maintain. That's and, and we have this nuclear reactor that we have to operate safely. But, you know, I go around the world now, and uh, whether it's a hospital or a manufacturing facility or a tech company, and it's all the same. It's, it, it's like people working together in a complex world, an uncertain world, trying to solve problems and the fundamental things. I, I get, I'm kind of getting stuck, but I'm basically it comes down to the same things, which is, does it feel safe for me to express my opinion? If I see that it's different, if the team seems to be going down this way, but I kind of see it different, do I say something or just keep it to myself? Do I, uh, how do I interact in a way that makes it easy for people to share what they think? So for example, we say, don't say, are you sure? Say, how sure are you? Because if, cause if I... Uh, Constru- a construction. See, company. are you sure? Are you sure that 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 um, implies right that you can have certain knowledge of the future? Well, it implies that you're. I mean, there's a certain implication that you're kind of telling me that I shouldn't be sure. It seems like. Yeah, maybe. Well, maybe it's a test. It's a probe, right? It's a provocation. Yeah. So if I say in a construction company, we're interested in safety. So if I say to you, "Is it safe?" So it's a binary question. Is it safe? Yes, because like few people are going to say no. It's a very high barrier to say like, no. Is, med- is Columbia safe? Is Columbia safe? Right. How do you answer that? Yes, <laughs> but comma. So we say. So, but if you say how safe is it? Uh, so one of our things is we do, we call it fist to five. So is it safe? How safe is it? Five out of five. Okay. And then one day a guy shows a four. Four. So I can detect, I'm asking the question in a way that it's easier for me to detect the signal in the response. Versus if I said, is it safe? Uh, is it safe? Yes or no? Yes, 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 Binary. yes, yes. It's a very, it takes a lot for someone to go like that. But it doesn't take much to go from here to here. Right. So what happens is I, now I detect a decrement in safety or whatever it happens to be. And then... Are we going to launch the product on time? That's not yes, how, no. Yeah. How likely is it we're going to launch on time? Five, 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 five. And then all of a sudden I start seeing four fours, then some threes. Like, so now I can detect that. It's easier for me to detect it. But the point is I'm asking the question the way it makes it easier for the detect. Not I give my people a lecture. And in doing that, you're creating 
an environment where people can be more honest about problems that they, they might otherwise not speak up about. Exactly, right. And so instead of saying the typical thing is, oh, I need you to speak up. Everyone's got to go to assertiveness training. That's, dodge, that's laziness because that's dodging the responsibility for how your behavior is affecting them. Mm-hmm. So I reflect it back to you and say, well, how, how are you asking questions? Are you asking questions in a way that makes it easy for them to speak up? Well, I don't know what you mean. Well, you can only control yourself. So you got to ask questions. If you want your team to speak up, then you got to ask questions in a way that makes it easy for them to speak Because up. the language is, a, is at the root of all of this, and there's so many examples of that in, yeah, in the book. I think so. Right, like the I intend to. Yeah, I intend to is a language thing. So when so you, you got on the submarine, you gave the order that couldn't be followed. <laughs> you say, all right, I'm so, going to need your help on yeah. this. I made a deal. I'd never give him another order. That was a I'll deal. I'll never give you... I'm never going to give an order on this. Another summary. order. Yeah, and as the captain. And then what happened instead? And then I still gave orders, but I still gave fewer and fewer and fewer orders. Because I said, if I'm going to lean back, then you guys have to lean in. Because if I don't give any orders, then you guys... Because they were trained to do what they're told. Because they were afraid of making mistakes. And when you're afraid of making mistakes then what happens is the best way to avoid a mistake is not to do man, not to make a decision. So in an organization that's focused on, I call it avoiding errors, an organization that's focused on avoiding errors is biased towards passivity versus an organization that's focused on achieving something. They're going to bias for action. So I, we need to do that shift. And then they started coming to me saying, hey, I, I intend to, I intend to, I intend to, and I was able to lean back further and further and they got more and more. And then it cascaded down the crew. So pretty soon, the junior guy. But if you, to go to your boss and say, I intend to, you really need to be thinking like your, like your boss or your boss's boss. And that was, the, um, that was the thing that we unlocked. So somebody comes to you, they say, I intend to load this, load this torpedo. Yeah. And, and you think it's a bad idea. Okay. How, do, how does that okay. conversation go? So that's perfect. So we, so we talk about that. So you think it's a bad idea. I intend to load a torpedo. I think it's the dumbest thing I've ever heard, right? So the old me, I would come at it from a mindset of, I'm right, you're wrong. Let me see if I can fix you. And there's a couple ways you can do it. If I'm running short of time, I'll say, no, 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 don't do that. And if I, and if I have a little more time, I'll say, well, let me tell you why. Try not to do that. Number two is I'll say, well... Have you considered and there to be sort of this pa- pa- you know pandering? Yeah, this paternalistic bullshit. He's tapping my knee yeah, right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> this is a sort of like pat on the head, young Padawan. Let me tear to your. But that again comes from this arrogant mindset that I know better. The question is, you're a smart person. You're closer to the problem than me. Why do you think we should load a torpedo? I have some information yeah, that you probably you, you don't. Know I something. probably have some information you don't have. Exactly. And so something. So now, now the job is. My job is to uncover that. So now what I say is, I even don't like saying why. Why do you want to do it? Because why can come across as provocative and puts people in defense. It also has the implication of... You got to defend your position. Uh, yeah, yeah, why? Right. Uh, uh, like it, it kind of reveals that you think it's a dumb idea. <laughs> exactly, right. And I'd say, hey, tell me more. So um, that's kind of where what I would kind of go to. And I, I would create, I call it a tell me time box. I would create this little time box in my head. And I would say, for 30 seconds or three minutes, whatever it is, I'm, gonna be- I'm just going to believe they're right. I'm just going to push the I believe button. And when you do that, what happens is you ask questions to learn more about where they're at and why they think that. In a very non pro you say, yeah, tell me more about that. Okay, I see, blah, blah, blah. Now, at the end of that, you could say no. You don't have to do it. So the words are, tell me more about tell that? Tell me more. Yeah, tell me more. Just tell me more. Or what do you, sometimes I say, what do you see here? Like, what do you see there? Uh, but, but because it's just description. Description is very safe psychologically. Well, I see that on the schedule is this, and I see, blah, blah. it's description. And then we might go to, okay, so we go from description to thinking. Um, basically thinking about causality. So it's like, uh, 
I think we, I think what's happening is this, but you're making judgments. And then we make projections to the future. So the best way to respond, because we're getting further and further into more uncomfortable territory where we get this more bigger chance of being wrong. And then we say, okay, so I think, so as a result of all this chain of thought, I think we should load a torpedo. And sometimes, even when I thought I was wrong, I still would say fine. As long as it was gonna It wasn't hurt. gonna hurt anything. Yeah, yeah, it's like, okay, fine. Because sometimes it turns out they were actually right. But even if it was wrong, they at least they come back with their head in their hand. <laughs> like, yeah, that wasn't such a good idea. And then they learn that the next yeah, time right. they don't they don't bother coming to you. They're just gonna come to you and want want the order. Right, because what to they do. come to you, they do more research. A lot of things I would say is if I thought I was boneheaded, I'd say, why don't you ask two other people? Because it was always like this higher, in the Navy, it's this hierarchy, like your boss is the font of all knowledge. And I was like, I needed to break it. So I actually changed some forms. A form would say, signed by a person at level two, then level uh, three, and then up at level four. The higher, the level higher you are in the organization, right? And, and I say, no, no, you're going to sign it by a person at level two. Then I want two other people at level two to sign it. If you get two other people at level two to sign it, then you're done. I don't need any level three or four signatures. Because you convinced two other people that it's a good idea. And we actually, I actually just like rewrote the form, Navy forms, to include these peer signatures. It's interesting. It's, it's like you're not only managing your own mental resources as a leader and the mental resources of everybody else who's, you know, in the traditional leader position, but you're also managing the, the, the mental resources of the, the people who are working for you too, because there's some sort of switch there. Like when you give somebody, specific instructions about something that turns off their their thinking in a way and then you, then it becomes i mean i've seen it before where i've if i've tried to put some instructions and say literally how to do something and follow these steps i i miss some detail all the time but it, yeah. it's easier just kind of like this accomplish this goal because now your objective in your mind is it's a performance objective and your, your, your objective is to follow the instructions, not achieve whatever the, whatever the instructions were written for when I write you a set of instructions. And typically in performance objectives, performance, uh, there's two kinds of per- per- performance mindsets you can have. One is performance approach or performance avoid. Performance approach is I want to, I want to show that I can get this done. But sometimes it's I want to, of performance avoid is at least I want to cover the fact that I'm incompetent. I want, in other words, I want to avoid mistake. It's avoid mistake mindset. So I need to make sure I get every one of these tasks done right. And when that's where your mindset is, you're not learning. And if you miss something, it's a fragile ecosystem because you're so focused on achieving step A through Z that you lose sight of the fact that what we're trying to do is actually, you know, build a piece of software that people can use, whatever it is. It, it, it sort of, it turns off the, the person's brain. You can't, they're, they're not able to, I can just imagine it just being so uneng- unengaging and then also you, are, it becomes an adversarial relationship. Am I doing this right? Am I following the instructions right. correctly? And then that can breed resentment and... <laughs> Cause morale to drop. Right. So, so this was a really hard problem for me. It's this issue, uh, and I go back to this red work, blue work thing, because there were times, like if I say, look, I need you to, we're starting the reactor, we're loading a torpedo. There's a, there are lengthy procedures for doing that. And I, and I don't want you to miss a step. And I want you to follow the procedure. But we needed to talk about Okay, we did that. So that, that's one mindset. Now I'm done starting the reactor and now, now I flip to this blue, this, um, mindset. Now I'm just, now I'm in a learning mindset. What did we learn? And what's the next thing to do? And making a decision about the next thing to do. You go to a hospital for elective surgery. I have yet to have someone tell me they, that the doctor came out and said, you know, we're not ready for you. Like, they're late, they can run late, but, but they never come out and say, you know what? I've checked with my team. I'm not sure they're ready for this because we got a new person and I'm not sure 
he or she knows what they're doing and two people came in late and this is a new procedure and I need more time to say, like they never say that. So not making a decision that they're actually ready to do the procedure. They're just, it's the next thing on the schedule. Bring in Katavi, let's cut them open. It's not a decision. It's just executing the schedule. So it's red work. That's red. That's interesting that you say that too, because uh, this is sort of an aside, but in the research that I've seen about color and and uh, psychology, blue, if you're in like a blue environment, might may enhance creative thinking. Well, maybe that's why red would yeah. in, in, enhance accuracy. Yeah. and make you more. Yeah. Uh, di- uh, vigilant, right? So maybe that's where, maybe that's sort of intuitively, I kind of guess. The right. red thinking is about yeah. following the, the following procedure, following instructions. Yes. Everything that's always there. I mean, I checklist for myself, right? For like publishing this podcast or even developing uh, an intro for it or something. I've got a checklist I follow, so I don't have to think about the same thing more than one time. And, and then if I do it enough times, eventually I can delegate that that piece off, and I've got the checklist, right? But but the checklist, the red list, the red thinking enables the blue thinking. Correct. But if you're in all red mode all the time, then your brain kind of turns off. If you're in all red mode, you're, blue is when you make the red better. If you're all red mode, you're just not getting any better. You're not being reflective about what you're doing. Mm-hmm. But if you're in all blue mode, you're never getting the work done. Like the work happens in the red. Mm-hmm. How did this affect your, your energy as a leader? Because I imagine that, you know, it sounds like uh, a, a quick tip, like a, oh, you just, just start saying, <laughs> just stop giving orders and, yeah, and yeah, have yeah. everybody say, I intend to, and right. there you go, and, right. you know, that, that's it. But obviously, I mean, this takes a lot of patience. You're going to have people coming to you. You're going to have, have conversations to help guide them through thinking yeah. through things. How did how did your energy change as a as a leader when you were <laughs> so, making the switch? Uh, so so um, one of the activities I give CEOs and uh, leaders uh, that we coach is go to dinner ten times, go to a restaurant ten times. So the next ten times you go out to eat, don't order. Just tell the waiter or the waitress. Pick my meal for me. And some people just can't do it. They say, well, I have food allergy. Fine, tell me you got a food allergy. Great, okay. But anything other than a food allergy, because what I want them to do is experience... Like a coffee shop or yeah, whatever. Yeah, giving up control. Okay, it's the feeling of giving up control. We ask people, how does it feel when you give up control? And the words we get back are generally the two kind, two groups of words. One group of words has to do with sort of this relief and freedom that's going to come from not having to micromanage everything. But there's also another group of words that come that basically are on anxiety, fear, and the nervousness of not being in control. Congratulations, you're a human, right? That's, and so I always used to think that that, when I felt that way, because there was this vision of we could be awesome and I could get out of the The anxiety of giving but, up yeah, the Yeah, but control. having the anxiety. I yeah. felt I was, I was like, trust your gut. So that anxiety would always push me away, push me back into wanting to take control of myself. And I, I, and I think leaders aren't, are not only are they not born, we're, we're born anti-leaders. Because you're born wired to want to be in control and to do this. We were just talking with David Alma's just talking about control as the ultimate is the ultimate addiction. Right. Right? It's like we all want to be in control. Right. So you have to fight that. So you have to act contrary because your instincts will be, you can't go crazy and just say, do whatever everyone do. Like that's irresponsible. But when you're feeling that and you're feeling that sort of tinge of anxiety, then you're on the right track. If you're not feeling it, then you're too comfortable and you're not building a team. And all you're doing is you're creating this dependency on you. And that's the feeling that you have to go towards. I mean, I can, I can relate to that feeling, and I'm sure you can as, as even a, as a writer. Like, yeah. Every time I hit publish on something, yeah. if I don't feel this sort of like, oh, I, I don't know, this yeah. is a little, maybe I'm being too revealing, right. or maybe, uh, maybe this is just not ready, or he didn't publish. Same sort of feeling as you're giving up control, you're allowing somebody else to make another decision. It, maybe it's not the same feeling, but it is, Discomfort. 
right? Like discomfort is your compass. Uh, I can't remember who one of my guests said that once. You got to go into it. That's right. You, you know you're on the right track. There's Noah Kagan, yeah. 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 Yeah, I agree with that. And so is that, is that a feeling that you learned to, to crave and go towards? No. <laughs> Sorry, I jumped on that pretty fast. <laughs> no, but I knew when I was feeling it, I, 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 it's like going to the gym and doing push-ups, right? Or, you know, whatever. I Give up control push-ups. Well, yeah, it's like you know that this short-term pain is going to create long-term benefits for you. But, you're, but your head is telling you you're doing the wrong thing. You're screwing your gut to say it. You know, uh, especially if, if I was tired or hungry or, you know, my boss had yelled at me or we were under time pressure, you know, any of those stressors, I would, I would kind of just naturally revert back. And um, I, uh, people talk about like giving feedback. I don't really care about giving feedback. What I care about is receiving feedback. And so we would have these yellow cards. And now we use these yellow cards where I say, uh, like you go to your team and you say, listen, I want to be a better listener, whatever it happens to be. And if you don't think I'm listening to, me, to you, then I want you to yellow card me. And because you want to invite feedback. And so the yellow card, it's not a red card, but it's a yellow card. And I would have to invite, I say, I would tell my guys, if you think I'm telling you what to do, I need you to let yellow card me. I need you to tell me that. And uh, it's about inviting. Because the self aware, I was not a very good, not a very self aware guy. You know, I thought I was a genius, you know, and good looking and everything you know outside of my head but or inside my <laughs> but so so you Me? in the process kind of learned that that you were having trouble giving up the control uh no but i would but what ha- you need is i call it's almost like a circuit breaker you, you need so what happens is you're in the moment and things are starting to happen and the tempo was picking up and someone says something that's not quite right, and you know it's not quite right, and you don't go into the tell me mindset. The you 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 bark at them, and 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 you start spiraling downhill, and you become you, you go into this emotional mindset, and you become very closed, and you start barking orders, and you need something to break you out of that. You need some. You need a visual t- clue that says you're. You're turning into an asshole. And, you know, yeah, somebody. Right, here's a clue. Keep you in check. Right. And it's, not, it's not so much that. It's, it was that I was turning into the leader. I was going back to the leader I didn't want to be. And I was, I was making my team, I was, I was adding stress to the team, which was putting them in a suboptimal position. Because for cognitive work, stress is not good. You want to kind of eliminate that. We're going to take a quick break. You know from my conversations with people like James Altucher and from the lessons I've learned from my former neighbor, Warren Buffett, you should always be investing in yourself. There's no better way to do that than to always be learning. That's why there's Skillshare. It's an online learning community with over 16,000 classes in design, business, and more. You can learn everything from logo design to JavaScript to screenwriting. If you're a professional or freelancer looking to brand yourself or grow your business, Skillshare has the class for you. I'm taking some voice lessons because I'm always trying to keep my vocal delivery good for this podcast. I'm also taking an accounting course to get a handle on finances for my business. And I'm taking Seth Godin's course, the Modern Marketing Workshop. You and I could walk into any business school in this country, to any marketing class in this country, and that's what's being taught. That what's being taught is a framework to think about what you do when you have something you want to market. And this course is about something else. This course says, market what works. Go check out Seth's course and 16,000 others. Skillshare is giving my Love Your Work listeners one month of unlimited premium access absolutely free. Go to Skillshare.com slash love your work to redeem your free month. What about for people who, you probably get this question all the time, what if you are in a position where you're the subordinate yeah. and you're trying to somehow train your boss right. to 
Uh, so, so we ask a little more control. Yeah. So we ask people, okay, let's say uh, I go to my team and they're and they've been used to being told what to do, and I say, well, what do you, th- you know, like, what do you see? What do you think? What would you like to do? And they're just like, nah, I'm good. You know, you tell me. It'll save a lot of time. And when we ask audiences, why is that? I've done this over 200 times on every continent. And the answer is, every single time, the answer is fear. The biggest word that comes up on the screen, we do poll, live polling, is fear. It's not that they don't know, it's because they're afraid to say it. Now we flip the question and we say, why is it the boss is micromanage? Why, are you, why is your boss a micromanaging jerk? It's the same response. It's always fear. I don't think that would be kind of a a, a revelation moment for them because you've primed them to 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 realize that it's fear. I think that most people would be like, oh, because because my boss is a is a jerk. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, And but because you've asked before, right? That them why they uh, act that way, it feels like they would then more easily realize, oh, my boss is 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 afraid. It's hard to see from that from their boss's uh, perspective. Right. You could say it's a fake question because I'm asking them to interpret what they're, what's going on inside their boss's minds. But when we talk to people and we say, why do you feel like you need to tell them what to do? And we really strip it back, it's just about fear. So, if you're going to your boss and you, we, we call it moving yourself up the ladder, they have the same, it's, it's about fear. So first of all, uh, you don't want to take too big a step. So if they've been telling you what to do and you go say, now I'm going to tell you what I think, that's too big of a step. You got to start with the same thing. You got to start with description. Hey, boss. And you got to start with the choice. Boss, this is your decision. You got to make it safe for them. This is your decision. So no contest of authority. We're going to support you 100%. This is your decision. Take it off the plate, right. Here's what I've thought of. Uh, not nope. Not yet. <laughs> Then, choice, would you like to know what the team thinks about this or what the, how the team sees this? Maybe even simpler than that. Just how we see the situation. They may say no, fine. You do that 10 times, they keep saying no, find a new job. Okay? They'll probably say, okay, fine. Would you like, do you want to send in your PowerPoint, video, come down to the shop floor, we'll show you. Like, how do you, like, again, choice, choice, choice. How do you want us to give the end? Just tell me. Okay, great. So here's what we think. Blah, 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 blah. Now what do you want us to do? But the problem is don't try and affect the decision. Your objective is to be heard. Your objective, I've worked for a lot of these guys and I've screwed it up. So I know how you can screw it up. Because I was always like, oh yeah, I got a better idea. And I would go in and they would feel very threatened. And they would feel, they would go into their fear mode and they reacted very poorly and it didn't work out. Well, this is what I like about you talking about, say, a PowerPoint presentation or something like that. I think so many people, they, they go to their boss or, or a coworker or, or whomever and they have this confrontation and naturally that person is going to be de- defensive. But when you give a, an opportunity to, to give them something that they can sit quietly and, and, and digest and it's right. not a big confrontational face-to-face thing where emotions are getting, are, are getting involved, you're, you're, first you're asking their permission, you're asking them if they want to exactly. know and they have to say yes, they've agreed, so now of course they want to know. Exactly. And now you give them clear communications, you don't sit there and just give them the litany of things that they have to process while they're trying to think about a bunch of other stuff. Exactly. And... Right. So I, I like that, yeah. So we got to the point where we called it, um, uh, we would do a lot of work on email. We'd send reports to each other, and so we'd write these reports. And so I called it one sentence, one paragraph, one page. So if I were sending you an email, let's take this load of torpedo thing. This, this, that's too small of an issue, but just imagine, okay. So I would say, uh, we intend to load a torpedo to this particular torpedo in tube two tomorrow, 10 o'clock. So it's one sentence. Now, if I read that, it makes sense to me. I don't have to read the rest. So that's one sentence, one paragraph. Then, then, they, then there's the paragraph description. Here's what we see, blah, blah, blah. And then, there's, then I'm like, yeah, okay, maybe. And then now there's the one page description. So we, so, we, so we get more and more detail. But the idea is it allows the boss, who's always very busy, uh, always very busy to decide how much uh, information they need 
how much cognitive resources to they want to dedicate to, dedicate to this, right? Making the, de- right. The, the decision, correct? And if they don't make the decision, it's just going to happen anyway, correct? Right? They could just ignore the email, right? Right? Perhaps, right? Most, and so what we think is, um, if you can't do that, it's because your thinking is muddled. Mm-hmm. Clear writing comes from clear thinking, muddled. Muddled thinking will never result in clear writing. If, if you're not able to, to do the writing of you, the decision. If you're not able to articulate it in a sentence and then a paragraph and then on a page. If you've got to start with a big, long story, then I'm not, you, then you haven't done enough thinking. I think this is useful for having a, a confrontation or types of confrontations people want, feel like they want to have with their boss sometimes is, is that... They might not actually be able to articulate. If they actually sit down and write the thing, the reason that they're upset, they might find out they're actually emotionally reacting, or that right. they haven't thought it through. Or as they're writing it, they're, I, mean, I, I find this happens to me all the time when I write to say support for uh, something's wrong with the software. I was just broken. I'm writing it, and like as I'm writing it, I'll write like oh, I don't know if it's this, and like wait, maybe it is that. Maybe it is. Maybe that is the reason why. And then right. I ended up deleting the email and never sent it to support. Sorry. I was pissed off when I started yeah, writing yeah. it, but I figured it out right, while right, I was right. writing it, just right. because I took the time to think about it. Right, right, right. You're all pissed off. Like you're fired. I'm gonna subscribe to somebody else and blah blah blah. And then by the time you're done, you're like, yeah, never mind. So yeah, it takes you out of that emotional <laughs> exactly. set. And it makes you start thinking. So it's like yeah. that's probably part of what makes it such a great way right. to lead. Um, and so now you're doing this, this consulting. I'm always curious about this. Just uh, you know, I've talked to David Allen. He does a lot of consulting, and, and you've you're started consulting. How does how does that work? I mean, you create this change in these organizations, but how do you? Um, what is it, what is it like the, I the hate the word consulting. I, I I wish I had another word for it. So if anyone has another word, let me know. Okay, um, it's. Uh, so, the best organizations, uh, like the best clients, I guess the way to say it, they don't need us. They don't like need us to, it's almost like we're just sort of um, an accountability partner maybe, or we give them some tools. They always say, this is exactly what I want. This is, ex- I, I, but you gave me a structure and a language mm-hmm. to use. The worst clients. So are, wait, are you saying that you're a placebo for them, or are you saying that? I mean, because I, 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 mean, I get this like when I when I talk to people on the podcast sometimes, like uh, I, there might be something about oh Jason Fried or or Seth Godin where, and this is the way that I, I think about doing podcast interviews is I'm like oh, I want to learn this thing from them, right? And they might say something that's. The exact same stuff they've written everywhere, right. but somehow just from sitting and having the conversation from them, a flip switches, and I may I'm like suddenly I have the superpower that I wanted from them. <laughs> yeah, I I wouldn't be so far. So I sometimes I feel like we're a placebo, and I like wow, you guys are doing all this great stuff already. Like, why do you need us? And like, no, we really need you. <laughs> Um, they're, they're scared. They need, they need the help. I, I think part of it is knowing that other people are doing it is helpful. Social and I proof. Yeah. yeah, and I think that we do have some tools that c- create some structure that 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 they can use. So I want to sort of give away my whole business, but uh, so we've. We started doing kind of traditional consulting, like, you know, we'll do a workshop or whatever. And I'm really trying to get away from that because I don't think that has a big impact. And I'm really trying, I'm really stuck in this language approach. And so I said, well, would you learn French by sending your people to a two-day course and they come back? Now they're going to speak French in the office. It's not like, that's not how it works. Mm. So we are working with, um, like, when we make big proposals to clients now. And we'll work at a very low level. Like, I'll just do a keynote or something sometimes. But for companies that say, we really want to implement this, we're we're talking with them about starting with a two-week, basically, boot camp. But it's we only meet for 30 minutes in the morning. And then you go to work. Because the idea is to create this very short iteration loop between I hear something and now I go practice it. 
Like say, like, yo hablo espanol. Now go back to the office and say that for 10 times to 10 people and see what happens, right? And then next day we have this, so we've practiced it in the environment, in our native environment, not in some classroom. Then we give another thing. Start your questions with how. How sure are you? Try that. Do another thing. Just Don't, do this today. Yeah, just do that. Work on this, this is your today. like key right. for today. That's that's yeah, that's great. That's uh, I mean, because you can only absorb so much information right. Right. at a time, and and then I mean, this is kind of how I design my own my own like design courses. they will be like, it's five minute video, fifteen or ten minute exercise and then don't watch the next video until the next day because you're gonna right. see these things it's gonna absorb into you you're gonna you're gonna sleep it's gonna become it's gonna get consolidated into your memory um, it's the ideas are gonna incubate the connections are gonna get stronger right your like brain that. has to actually grow new connections and it's not gonna happen in one minute right so it's not like history class I can tell you the Treaty of Westphalia was in 1648 you can learn that but you can't learn to change the behaviors and the language that you've been using at work for X number of years. Yeah. Well, speaking of this learning, you wrote this book. I mean, were you an experienced writer? <laughs> so, by the way, <laughs> top 12 book, top 12 business books of all time, USA Today. Yeah. And it is a fantastic book. Thank you. Uh, how did you learn how to write a book? <laughs> so... Uh, so my background is in physics and engineering. First of all, my wife was beating me on the head. She said, you know, you hate your job. You know, you need to, cause I was doing some, I was doing actual nonsense consulting. Anyway, so I said, okay, well, I got to write a book. What is that? So wait, this was, you, you I, I you're, was at, you're out of the Navy. I was out of the Navy, You're yeah. in civilian life. Yeah. You're doing I was consulting. Running, I was running a consulting company, consulting basically back to the Navy you, on how, not- what submarine commanders thought, whatever. But it wasn't very... Fulfilling. And you had already been captain of this ship that it was, Stephen Covey came to yeah, visit. And it had, that was 10 years earlier. It had been 10 years now. But over those 10 years, that's when the 10 guys got promoted to captain because it took that long for that whole... Uh-huh. So, so I realized that that's the story I wanted to tell, not the turnaround, but this longer look the development of more leaders. That's the story I wanted to tell. And so I said, well, what is a, st-? I just started with like, what is a story? And so I read, started reading Aesop's fables. I said, what are the greatest stories? Like Aesop's fables, grim fairy tales. Did you read any Joseph Campbell? Yes. The hero with a thousand faces? Yes. That sort of stuff? Yes. I read, mythology? Correct. I read all that stuff. So You read all that, all the Joseph Campbell stuff? Well, I read. I probably didn't read it all, but I read some of the stuff. So, if I tell you, here's a story. There's a person who's an orphan. They have some secret power, and they wield their secret power through something that has they hold in their hand. You don't know at this point. I could be talking about Harry Potter or Luke Skywalker. Okay, so at that level, they're the they're the exact same story. And there's the other group I connect with. The rest of the people have the secret power. And we're going to wield it for good. It's the same story. Basically, that's that story. Because, and that's why I talk about my flashlight. That was my, my that, flashlight. That was, was my your light, lightsaber. That was my lightsaber. And so it's not, we didn't make the story up. It's true. But I tried to understand the pattern of a story. And if I tried to tell it in a way, because I, when I wrote the book the first six times, there was no, I didn't talk about my flashlight. Because I didn't understand the importance. I carried it. It was a very important thing on the ship, but I didn't realize why it was so important. It's part of what really brings the, the book alive because, because there's, there's action. I mean, there's, there's action in, you know, you're in a submarine. It's a certain environment. The stakes are high. Yeah. It's the most unlikely place to do a leadership model like this because it's the military. Right. Um, and there are actions in the book where you're using the flashlight to look around uh, to diagnose a problem and yeah i wanted i wanted people to be able to visualize the story as they were reading the book and to when they closed the book i wanted them to be able to say ah i know what happened i was sick of these leadership books where it's like oh I'll put, it's all about me and take care of your people and oh okay great i never thought of that right and then then it's like well what do they actually do what do they actually say 
how did it actually change? And you're left with all these scratching the head. And so I, and the book's been criticized. Some people say, well, there's too much submarine detail in it. But that was, there was a deliberate decision of mine to say. I like that. It was cool. <laughs> to, 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 you ha to have any credibility, you got to have some detail. And so I was thinking about, I, read, I love Tom Clancy books. And I was thinking about his books. And I said, I want to mean my book to be like Tom Clancy, but a real story that was helpful for people. And I wanted to tap into this, like, what is the story? What do humans remember? What connects with them? Wait, so you didn't, I mean, there must have been something ahead of that. You didn't just pick up these books and read Aesop's fables, and within a few months you had stories figured out. Was it, was it really that easy, or was well, there some foundation there for you? I mean, I would, I've been a reader, I mean, so I had yeah. some idea. You mentioned Beowulf. And, and yeah, I love something. Beowulf, but I, and then I had this big scroll where I, I had this big, long piece of wrapping paper, like 30 feet long, that brown paper. Mm -hmm. And I started putting yellow stickies on this paper. And I started, and I, and I was trying to connect a, um, a character with an event and what we learned, what I learned. And it was all vanilla. And, and it didn't really come alive until I finally was like, pissed off and I hate hate my life and then I finally just sort of got into my own head and all the fears that I was dealing with and like how I was insecure how I was afraid how did that manifest itself in your writing the yeah. insecurity I would say it I would just say I was I was afraid I didn't know what to do I was paralyzed but or whatever. before you discovered those the insecurity or the fear what, what was it doing to your writing it was it was sort of, um, you know, pontificating from the mount, yes. right? I'll, let me let me tell you, yeah, how you should be, and this sort of success is kind of preordained, and I had it all figured out from birth. Yeah, exactly. Sort of it, well, yeah, and the, the experiment that we ran. And I had it all figured out. And really, that was nothing could be further from the truth. We were just in this desperate times where we would try these things. And if it was good, we would do yeah. it. And if it was a disaster, we would stop. And uh, I, one of the things I worry about is there is this sort of, there is a sort of sense, well, I'm reading a book about leadership, so it must have worked out, right? So there is this sense that I know the, 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 the final chapter, but... Uh, it was very chaotic, and all this stuff we talk about now, be a know-not, but t be, be a know-all, but tell-not leader. You know, the ladder of leadership, the structures that we use are all made up afterwards. Well, wait, when, you're, when your supervisor uh, came to you or said, you're not going to go on this ship, you're going to go on this other ship, right. it was a, a situation of like, well, the ship's kind of screwed up, so I know that you turn in a blank sheet of paper at the leadership uh, <laughs> training because you didn't think that that's the way a leader should lead, that you were going to put down your principles on a piece of paper. Right, right. So the ship's kind of screwed up, and you know maybe this will work. This might not work, right, is, is kind of the attitude that there was when you were starting this. For me? Right? For you and for your supervisor. I can't remember what the... Yeah, Mark Kenny, my... Yeah, he... So he made a great decision because it worked out. I thought it, I thought it was a disaster, but you know, putting me over there. And I asked him later. Said, "Why did he do?" He said, "Because I was really showed a lot of curiosity in that twelve. He he was a guy who ran that twelve month school uh, where I was getting ready for the other submarine. But he did show I, I had a zest for learning. I had a lot of curiosity, and that that was." He didn't know how or why, but he knew that was going to so be Maybe important. you could turn the ship around. Right. And I guess you were saying at the end of it, when you write a, when you write a story, I mean, I've, I've, there's been things I've written that happened 10 years ago, and, you know, it's the story changes as time goes by. You have right. this, this, this luxury of, of retrospect that then allows you to pick the contours of the story because you, know, you can't tell the whole story Right. And those contours come out over time. It takes a long time. So I had a, couple, I had a couple of things that helped me with. Number one, a lot of the stuff is it's just documented in record. 
and it's an official Navy records, what, what we did, the scores we got, and the evaluation. As a captain, you keep all the evaluations for the people. So I wrote evaluations on all my officers, and I had copies of all of them where I talked about the different things that we did. But the other thing was this. I kept a journal. I kept a journal, and every night I would write in that journal, we are so effed here, you know? And I have no idea, and I had a talk with this guy, and I wrote the guys, I I would write their names in the book. I was standing in the engine room lower level, da da da, and they said this, and I said that, and it would be quoted in the book. So when I wrote the book, it has, you don't really sense, you don't really notice it, but it has the grit of reality because it is real. Well, because there are conversations that are quoted, and I guess, I, I mean, I always figure that a lot of authors, they fabricate they make certain situations yeah. that, fit the, that yeah. fit the story that they want right. to have. Right, right. And, um, yeah, the Navy put it on the, read, the official Navy reading list. They wouldn't have done that if it was a made-up, you know, if I, made, if I played fast and loose with any of the yeah. facts. And I, I am... Uh, I think that's one of the power, that's the part of the power of the whole thing, is that it's a real story with real people who really did something and really felt certain things. Yeah. Not a business fable, which is an interesting genre, but this isn't a business fable. It's a real story. Yeah, and going back to the uh, posture of writing from from on the mountain, from on top of the mountain, or right. writing from the ivory tower or right. something, that's, I mean, when you read something like that, it sucks, it just, right? This is, yeah. but it's hard to, it's yeah, hard yeah, to yeah. see it when you're reading your own writing. And I think this is important. <laughs> it's just important for a lot of people who are listening because I know I have people come to me all the time. They're like, oh, I, I kind of want to start blogging and stuff, but I don't yeah. feel like I'm an expert on anything. And, and they're like, that's the problem is if you're thinking that you're going to be writing like you're the expert, right. then your, your writing is going to be crap anyway. you gotta, you got to just say, this is what I did. This is what happened. You know, maybe I'm wrong about this and that and the other thing. And that gives credibility, strangely, to, to the writing. It makes it, it makes it alive and it makes it... But it's so hard to find it in your own writing. I mean, yeah, it takes look, a lot look, of... I, I was, I was a, self-awareness. a physics major, engineer. I was a, one, I was a submarine captain. We we're not touchy-feely people. Mm-hmm. We don't give a shit about your emotions, right? I just need you to push the button when you're supposed to push the button, right? Yeah. You know, that's kind of where we're from. And we had to learn on, on the submarine. We had to learn. I had to learn, and I had to in, create the environments where my people could speak in terms, they could say things like, you know, I'm only 80% sure about this, but here's what I think is going on. Versus in the movies, it's like, we're here, the enemy's there, go there, kill them. Right. That's not at all what it's like in reality. It's like, yeah, I think they might, but it could be they're not. So we got to keep, and, and we had to, I had to learn how to speak in terms of ambiguity and uncertainty and really get comfortable with it. Um, because then my, otherwise my crew wouldn't have been yeah. comfortable with that. Because when you're talking about the future, you're just never certain. If it's certain, there's no decision, right? You just, oh, I'm standing on train tracks, trains coming, get off. It's not a decision. Yeah, and then strangely, when you write that way, it also it can give. I mean, there, there's something to nice to authority, author, authoritative writing, like do it this way and don't do it that way, and blah blah. blah. But there's also there's also something nice to self-effacing, um, or just l- losing the ego in in writing. Yeah, well, I think it's, it's a mask, right? If you have to wear a mask, it's just like what happens at work. If you have to wear a mask then it's going to suck. It, it turn, I feel like it turns off your, your, your active thinking the same way that having a micromanaging, domineering boss does in that... I feel like there's a, there's a connection there somehow cognitively that like turns off that switch when you... Um, yeah. Yeah. When you when when you maybe get, get too much in your own ego when you're when you're writing and stuff. Yeah. Um, now, how about like I noticed the, the, the chapters are are like nice and short. It's such an easy book to read. Yeah. That way was stole that, that something that? Yeah, I stole that from James Patterson. Oh, okay. 
No. It's like, you read, you read these things now. It's a page like, turner. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I wanted, I wanted, I wanted to grab and some And you can that. read it at so many different layers, too, because the, there's the summaries in the back. There is um, plenty of subheads and there's short chapters and everything. Like, I think that's like, yeah. some people, they, they want to invest. You can flip through the book in 20 minutes and get a, the gist of it, and then you yeah. can dive deeper into the other parts of it that are, that it was, are interesting to you. It sucked. It was hard work. Yeah, um, so, how, I mean, how did you manage actually? I would set my timer. What's the process like? I would set my clock. I would, I would say, tw- I'm going to write for 20. Every, like, if you wake up, like, I didn't have a job because I quit this consulting thing. Yeah. And so, if you say, oh, oh I'm going to write for eight hours today, it just makes your head explode. Yeah, no. And so, I'd say, I would write for 20 minutes. I, may, I can make that commitment. I would set my timer for 20 minutes. And sometimes when that 20 minute timer went off, I was like, oh, thank God. Up and go out. And something like 20, 20 minutes went off. I went, doink. Then another, you're moving. Another 20, another 20. And so that's. Oh, so you would reset the 20 minutes. I would just reset. So that you wouldn't. Uh, Correct. You, so you would turn off the anxiety in your brain about. Uh, because the, the little, the little I don't know if it's like a little monkey or a little kid inside of you is like, ah, I want to play. Yeah, what are you, exactly. you're going to be sitting in this chair yeah, for eight I hours? I want to go work out, right? I want to go do something else. And then, uh, but if it's 20 minutes, 20, but you, 20 minutes. You can do anything for 20. You can hold your breath for 20 minutes, right? So that's what you do. I mean, I've got an exact thing I've written about a, a number of times this 10 minute hack of, yeah. of anything. And I think that you really, you really come face to face with your own, um, your own self-deception um, and your own need to uh, have a good self-image when you do that because you, you think to yourself, no, 20 minutes is more, but 10 minutes, you're like, 10, I, mean, I, can, I can do something for 10 minutes and right. not, but then, but then the, the excuses start to pop into your brain and you have to right. bat them away because you want to... You want to feel good about yourself. You'll feel terrible about yourself if you can't do 10 minutes. But if you committed to eight hours, it'd be really easy to be like, oh, I've got to change the oil on my car. Right. You know, and, and then you would feel just fine about yourself um, because it was... Because the brain protects yourself. You skirted it off yeah. of such, just something that was so, so much bigger. The other thing was I, I had to learn to write with my fingertips. I call it writing with my fingertips, not in my head. Because normally, when I, so I look at the computer screen, I write a sentence in your head. Like, you know, Jack and Jill went up the hill. Ah, oh, that's not a good sentence. Mm. Uh, but your fingers aren't moving. Yeah, your fingers aren't moving. So it's all in your head, you know. Jill and Jack ascended the hill, you know, and then like, nah, that's not quite right. Uh, they went up a steep hill. Like, so 10 minutes Just later, write the sentence. Ten, yeah, 10 minutes later, <laughs> it's in your head. Right, it's still in your head. There's nothing on the on the computer screen. So rigor mortis is I, set I in by say, that point. Just tight, because writing is really rewriting for me. Uh, the first time it sucked so bad, and then it's the rewriting process. It's the improvement process. So, but now it's so easy because I use the dictation mode on my Mac. I just talk to my computer. It's like blah 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 blah. So you, after the, the the crappy first draft, did you have to restructure the whole book after that, or was so, the structure that so clear? So two. I think the I think the books win on structure. The, I mean, this is a very structured book. I think there's a huge yeah. Part I think of they success. win first on structure, then maybe story, because you got to have a reason to go to the last page, and then and then utility, and then <laughs> yeah, utility. But then and and and, and then the detail of the writing. Yeah. Um, I read specificity. Another guy I read was George Orwell. Orwell is a master of his his early stuff. Uh, he's a master of these sort of these um, amoralistic, non-judgmental descriptions of situations, which you read it like, oh my god, how can he not be expressing some sort of a judgment uh-huh. through the writing? But he's just sort of describing whether it's amazing or bad or horrible or whatever, and you're like repelled by the p- people's behavior, um, like down and out. I think it's that down and out in London and Paris was one of those. And so yeah. I wanted to, uh, so I tried to tap into that ability just to describe a scene dispassionately and let the reader put their emotions. On I think the that's scene. interesting because I know I've read I, I, I've, I've read a lot of writing where somebody does put the moral. 
yeah. thing on there. Like, this was terrible. Right. And this was awful. And like, well, right. I mean, what does that even mean? Just describe the scene. Just describe and, it. Right. Let. <clears throat> right. Uh, uh, yeah. Hemingway, there's a great Hemingway quote about, you know, if say you're like catching a fish and you feel excited. Well, think it back to the image that made you feel the thing that you felt right. and find the word for that image and that's going to transfer that emotion to the person who is reading it. Right. Yeah, um, if you can do that, I think you're on the right track. Yeah. Though Hemingway would, al- Hemingway would also do the, uh, it was damn awful. Right. It was awful. When it came to descri- <laughs> right, for describing my own things, I would try and do that. The other thing was the word very is a useless word. Yeah. I did a word search and I deleted every very. The very last thing I did before I sent it to the publisher was I deleted every very. Almost, in the book. just. Yeah, all those words. Just pick. I, my, my rule was pick the most precise English word for the thing. So you won't say, I see a tree, I see a palm tree, I see a sable palm, or what, like just be as precise as possible. And English is such an amazing and rich language that. So you you were a reader, but how much writing were you doing before this? You write. I mean, there's a lot of writing. Any leader, any leader is going to do writing. That's yeah. how you express. I I have this argument with people sometimes, and they're like, "Well, why do you have to write it down?" Because I will tell my team or I'll tell the client, "Okay, write down what you want to achieve. Write the intent statement because it's like this. I intend to. Okay, I want you to write it down." Like, what do you actually intend to do? And, well, why do I have to write it down? And I said, well, what if, let's just talk about it. I said, great. What if the guys back in Philadelphia just said, let's just talk about the Constitution. We don't need to really write it down, <laughs> right? How, where would we be today? And so I'm a huge fan of writing the thing down. Huge fan. It's the math. Of, writing was the original coding. Right. I always think it's like a stack trace for your brain. Right. Um, Whatever that is. But. Which is like, you know, it, it, it gives you what the error is. So right. You can find out, oh, it was this method that, um, oh, there's a bug in this method. It's in the right. documentation or something like that. You can write something and you, you write something and you read it and you're like, oh, that's bullshit. No, that's not right. And then you right. write it again. and It's coding. It's the original yeah. coding. And so like some 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 people are... Like Rich Sheridan up at Menlo is doing pair coding, right? So we would do pair writing. Like we would put two people on a document and do, it's just. Oh, really? I'm convinced. Writing was the original coding. In fact, the original books were called codexes, right? Right. C-O-D-E-X's. It's the original coding. What was the uh, last book that you read that changed the way that you saw something? Uh, I'm reading, I'm, I'm almost done with uh, Matthew Syed's book called... He's going to kill me. Uh, it's, about, it's about failure. It's, about, it's, it's called Black Box Thinking. Why some organizations and people learn and some don't. And basically, it's... If you look at like the airline industry and how they take this uh, investigate this sort of non-judgmental investigative approach to uh, mistakes, and you compare it to other industries, and he uses the medical, for example, uh, medical is horrible in terms of error rate, and their whole approach is different, and so they're not learning from their mistakes because mistakes get wrapped up in lawsuits that get wrapped up in non-disclosures, which actually suppress and don't let the information come out versus an airline accident. And so... People are afraid of the consequences. Yeah, so, so, so the medical industry is not very good about learning. They're not self-learning about mistakes. Now, there are exceptions, and some hospitals are doing better, but as an industry, he makes a pretty strong case that they could learn a lot from the way the airlines, and he takes has a couple of other examples, but uh, he's, he's, his background is in sports, uh, and he's in the UK, uh, Matthew Syed's book. It's, it's, it's good. Great. And we talked about a lot of cool stuff today, writing and, and, and leadership and how to get a leader, how to try to promote leader leader in your own organization. 
Do you have a final message that would kind of sum up our conversation today? It, it starts with, first of all, everyone's doing amazing things, but it starts with you. Uh, if you wrote down a bunch of things and say, well, when I go back and talk to my team, I want them to do ABC, then you kind of missed the point, I'd say. You know, it starts with like, how do I change my behavior so that it makes it easier for the team to be better just the way they are? That I'm not trying to go out and you know, rewire people's brains. Give up that control. Yeah. Where can people find more of you? L. David Marquet. Um, yeah, so our website, uh, davidmarquet.com. And the other thing we have is we have these things called leadership nudges, which are little 60 second blurbs on my YouTube channel called Leadership Nudges. You go to Leadership Nudges, just Google it, and you'll see them on YouTube. And you can subscribe to the channel or en- enroll and get them every week. We have like 160 of them now. And they're, I try and keep them to 60 wow. seconds or less. And it's usually just me, iPhone, selfie mode. Hey guys, I'm here in uh, you know Medellin and blah blah blah. And here's the lesson for today, kind of thing. Great. Well, I'm glad that you made it down here. I'm glad we were able to sit down and have this chat. Yeah. Thank you so much. All right. Cheers, brother. I hope that conversation with David Marquet helps you save mental energy as a manager, and maybe it even helps you get more control and input in your collaboration with your own boss. We all want to find meaning in our work, but we often expect others to be motivated purely by money. Listen to behavioral scientist Dan Ariely on episode 57 to learn how to motivate others as well as yourself. Intel lost 5% of productivity by giving people a $30 bonus. Now, 5% might not seem a lot. It's a lot. Again, Dan is on episode 57. And I personally loved talking to David Marquet about going from being a submarine captain to trying to put his story into words. If you enjoyed that, you'll also enjoy episode 85 with David Allen. David shares how he used the Getting Things Done system to actually write the book, Getting Things Done. But again, that's the magnificence of of the digital, you know, word processors. It's like they let you have ideas later on to figure out where they go. So you're sitting down and just giving myself the freedom to just write an idea out and then, you know, do double, you know, click, 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 you know, and then another idea, write it out, click, 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 click. Editing is really the art of writing, you know, uh, you know, so you write the crappy first draft and then come back and then look at what you've done and then see what shows up there from a higher altitude. Again, David is on episode 85. I work hard to help you crack the code on fulfilling work. If Love Your Work is helping you, there are some ways you can help support the show and make it even better. One is to subscribe, 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 subscribe. This is especially effective on Apple Podcasts or iTunes because it boosts rankings and helps others find the show. I know many of you listen on Overcast because you're the early adopter types. So even if you don't listen on Apple Podcasts or iTunes, please subscribe there anyway. Subscribe in your iPhone, your iPad, your Apple TV, your computer. The more devices, the better. It really helps. Apple Podcast ratings help too. Just go to cadavy.net slash Apple, click on write a review, and click on the star rating. You don't even have to write a review. It just takes a couple seconds. You can also join Love Your Work Elite. You'll get access to episodes before everyone else. You could even get ad-free interviews weeks in advance, and you can get your name or business mentioned in the credits of the show. For details, go to lywelite.com. That's lywelite.com. Love Your Work is brought to you in part by top Love Your Work elite members such as Arif Akhtar. This has been Love Your Work, and I'm David Cadavy. The theme music for the show is More Streets, performed by Spider Flower. Love Your Work is a production of Cadavy, Inc.